The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town of Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And coming to her, he said, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at what was said and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of David his father, and he will rule over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. But Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I have no relations with a man? And the angel said to her in reply, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month for her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible for God. Mary said, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I wanted to start today by reading you a short section out of Pope Benedict's book, Jesus of Nazareth. It's actually the third in the series. In his writings, Bernard of Clairvaux portrays heaven and earth as it were holding its breath at this moment of the question addressed to Mary. Will she say yes? She hesitates. Will her humility hold her back? Just this once, Bernard tells her, do not be humble but daring. Give us your yes. This is the crucial moment when from her lips, from her heart, the answer comes. Let it be to me according to your word. It is the moment of free, humble yet magnanimous obedience in which the loftiest choice of human freedom is made. Now, as many of you know, I'm a big fan of Benedict, and I'm certainly a mama's boy, so any chance that I have to preach about Our Lady, I will certainly take it. And so today was nice because I didn't have to stretch to do so, as our gospel is Luke's account of the Annunciation. This same gospel that we heard just a couple of weeks ago at the celebration of Our Lady's Immaculate Conception and which we heard even earlier than that back in March at the Feast of the Annunciation. Multiple times during the liturgical year, we are reminded of Mary's fiat. Fiat, another word that's part of the Catholic lexicon. As a convert, I can tell you that we as Catholics have such a unique language that it's no wonder ecumenical efforts are challenging let alone differences in faith, our brothers and sisters of other faith traditions simply can't understand the language that we speak. And we use this word fiat often, and not just in relation to Our Lady's fiat. We use it as a fancy way of acknowledging someone's yes. And we often say that yes to almost anything is someone's fiat. We use it, but then we feel guilty about it. How can I compare my yes to Our Lady's? And so we'll often assuage our guilt by saying that our yeses are lowercase f fiats, and her fiat is, 
is the ultimate uppercase F fiat. The problem is we don't really grasp the full import of what this word really means, what it represents. See, it doesn't actually mean yes. And I know this might sound odd, as we just heard Pope Benedict and St. Bernard of Clairvaux refer to Mary's yes, and yes, fiat includes an implicit yes, but I think it's important to appreciate the nuance here, appreciate the depth of this word. If we examine the word yes, there are many words in Latin that can be used to say yes, ita or seek. But ita, for example, translates as it is so, and fiat translates as let it be done, and it is so and let it be done are two very different things. So why do I think this is important? Well, Mary is presented for us as the model to follow. She's presented us as as the ultimate role model. And when we look at her fiat, what are we actually emulating? What are we emulating when we're called to model her fiat? And I think that we first need to understand her ability or lack thereof to sin. Now, I think that we all agree here that Mary never sinned, ever. But some argue that not only did Mary never sin, they argue, and argue very convincingly, that Mary was impeccable, that she was incapable of sinning. Not only was she saved from the stain of original sin, not only did she have no concupiscence, no inclination or unbalanced desire for sin, but being full of grace, so perfectly did her will align to that of the fathers that it would not even have been possible for her to sin. And so if Mary is impeccable, if by virtue of the graces that she received, the graces bestowed upon her, and if she didn't make a choice to sin or not sin, if she couldn't sin, then what value is there in her yes for us? Sure, she had free will, but she would have been unable to say no to God. So how then is this a model for us? Father John Hardon, he's a Jesuit. He gives what I believe a great explanation. He says, sinless Mary was impeccable, preserved by an extraordinary grace from God from ever being capable of offending God by deliberate sin. Yet, though impeccable, Mary was able to choose. This bears emphasis, he says. He says, we are so accustomed to identifying freedom as choosing between good and evil that we forget that the highest use of our liberty is not to choose not to sin, but rather to choose to do more than we have to do or that we are obliged to do in a word to be generous. And says, like Mary then, we can choose to give God more than he demands under pain of sin. We can choose to love God with our whole heart and not just to avoid his punishment. So my friends, Mary didn't just say yes to God. She she didn't just acquiesce to God's proposition because she was unable to say no. Rather, Mary's fiat, her let it be done, indicates a complete abandonment, a complete giving of herself to what she was asked for, the ultimate act of generosity. At 12 to 14 years of age, she became Theotokos. She became the mother of God. And that wasn't just the end of her giving of herself. She didn't just give birth to Jesus and then walk away. She lovingly 
and carefully raised the Son of God. She became the first and most perfect disciple. She was there with Jesus during his ministry. She was there with him when he died on the cross, and she's with him now in heaven. That was her fiat. And this is the model that we're we're asked to follow And so, my friends, as we go through this Advent, as we spend these last few days, goodness gracious, these last precious few days, the start of Christmas shopping season for many, as we spend these days in preparing for Christmas, let us strive to move beyond just a desire to turn away from sin. Let's strive to move beyond just giving our yes to God rather than no to Him. But rather, let's follow the example of Our Lady Mother and truly give our Lord our fiat. Let us give Him everything. Everything. And may and proclaim each and every one of us May it be done to me according to your word, to your word.